Hey, everybody. How are we doing today? It's Thursday. It's the TIP and the SIP. So it's TT, Thursday, Thursday, and we're MIP. We're Merlot in place. So tonight's a great night. Uh, hits me right here. We start talking about Merlot or Zen. Uh, so it's going to be a lot of fun tonight. Hope you guys enjoyed the videos, uh, seeing where this uh, fruit comes from. Um, so everybody can hear me. So we're here, ready to go. I know they can see me. So we are ready to rock and roll and talk about Merlot. So tonight, um, I think, like I've said before, Merlot, I think, is one of the best grapes that we grow. It's just in the soil, the clones, it's just the perfect climate for it. And I really love our Merlots. Um, Merlot got a bad rap long ago, and it wasn't from the movie. The movie didn't help. Uh, but, you know, California went crazy with Merlot, planted Merlot where it shouldn't be planted. We got a lot of green flavors and jalapeno popper type of stuff, and it was just nasty. So that really killed Merlot more than anything else. Um, the final nail in the coffin was the movie, but hey. But we're here today. We're tasting some great Merlot and having a lot of fun. Um, one of the things that we didn't put on our food pairings that always works great with, uh, with big red wines like a Merlot or a Cab or Figs, so always keep that in the back of your mind. Uh, figs always work well. The marinated eggplant is kind of one of my favorites, more the uh, Italian style where it's sliced, it's marinated for a couple of days. It's that heavy olive oil, a little bit of garlic and then pepper, um, you know, maybe a little red pepper flake on top of it. It just goes really well, I think, with, uh, with these red wines like this. Um, I like a lot. Grilled vegetables and fruit, again, to do. Uh, and then really big flavored cheeses. If it's a fish dish, that's why I go for Chipino. Chipino, that fish stew with that big hearty red, uh, you know, the, the red style soup. And, uh, you know, it's just a fish stew basically, but it's a more richer style and it's got a lot of bigger flavors. And that's why I think these red wines do real well with that for a fish dish. I'm always trying to find fish, meat, and, and vegetables to kind of go with, the, with these um, wines because it makes it uh, a little more fun to play with. So, um, you know, when I talk about duck and I talk a lot because I really like duck and I talk about lamb a lot because I eat a lot of lamb and I love lamb and you, it's too, uh, and it goes really well with the, these things with the plum sauce. Um, but I'll be honest with you, chocolate, dark chocolate covered blueberries are just awesome with like this wine. I really love it with the Merlot. Um, it's, you know, when you get done eating dinner and you still have a little bit left in your glass and you pop, some dark chocolate mocha with Merlot just seems to work really well. And especially dark chocolate. Um, I'm a big fan of dark chocolate. All right. Um, one of the things we did this week is we actually gave you, um, it's actually my recipe for leg of lamb. Um, I like to use a bonus leg of lamb. Uh, the reason why is that it's easier, a little easier to cook and it's easier to get all those flavor profiles into lamb. And when they, uh, when they bone it and butterfly it out, it leaves a lot of grooves and slits on the inside where you can really pack it with a lot of this rub. So it makes a lot of fun. So experiment with it, have some fun with it. Um, it's probably one of our go-to meals we have uh, when we feel like barbecuing something big a lot. Uh, so anyway, so that's there. And plus their uh, Royal Crown Roast of Pork, which is basically just think uh, it's prime rib, but it's pork. And it's awesome. I, I love cooking that also. Uh, and rubbing it down, just changing it up a few things. So play with your, play with your spices and your cupboards. Um, one of the things that I was thinking about that I like to do is Chinese five spice, which is really heavy in cloves. And there's a lot of clove in these wines tonight that will work really well also um, with whatever you're preparing. So that's a fun thing to kind of add in there too. All right, um, as you saw in the vineyards, a lot of rock. Uh, so you see what we're talking about with Torrent and with our Merlot, very well-trained soils. And you saw those two creeks that were side by side, uh, the vineyards. So Felice Creek is, uh, and McDowell. McDowell Creek actually goes into Dooley Creek, uh, which you're going to see next week. We'll talk about Dooley Creek a little bit more, which is from uh, over by our cab. So Dooley Creek and Felice Creek are both major fish uh, habitats for California steelhead trout. Um, so it's very important to us that we protect those habitats. Um, and there's also like a ton, like Felice Creek is just loaded with salamanders at the same time. So, so it's very important that we protect those habitats uh, and be conscious and be good stewards of the land. Uh, because that land gives us these great wines, uh, you know, the great grapes these great wines come out of, uh, which Len Brutico and his crew does. So, you know, so it's an awesome thing. So 
Before we start tasting wine, again, as always, with me is Kevin Brutico. Say hi, Kevin. Hello, everyone. We got David Brutico over here also. Hello. Yep, and then we got Karen Brutico here tonight also with us. Say hi, Karen. Hi. Yeah, got to say hi to the family back east. Hi. There you go. Okay, so let's start tasting some wines. So I'm going to start actually with the Reserve Merlot first. Uh, the Torrent is a lot bigger. Uh, and because of the style of that wine and the bridles that are in it, so we're actually going to go to this wine right here, this beautiful Reserve 2013 Merlot. This wine is 100% Merlot, and it's about 90% of the grapes came from that Block 20. The other 10% came from what's called, it's the old Block 7 uh, that we had of uh, Merlot, which was one of our standout Merlot vineyards for a long time. So if you taste some older, like uh, pre-2000, probably 2005 and older Merlots from Brutico, it's from that block, that older block, uh, which was, it's, again, very similar, uh, not quite as gravelly, but it was a, a little bit, um, but similar characteristics, but not as deep and as rich, I think, as Block 20 is. Um, but uh, again, some great older Merlots that are holding up really well. Um, you know, when this whole thing lifts and you guys can come see us at our tasting room, uh, Kevin and Chris actually have some of these older wines out there that you can purchase uh, that are tasting great. And every once in a while, um, especially for you wine club members, you come out to wine club barbecues or wine club events, we actually try to open a couple of those bottles up so you can taste them, which is a lot of fun for not only you, but for us to experience it. All right. So 100% Merlot. Um, it spans our reserve program is two years in a barrel. So the Brutico program is 18 months, where this is 24 months in a barrel. So this is a very barrel select. We go through select certain barrels for this program uh, and bring it out. So one of the things that I think um, I really get in this is that really is like this lush, dark fruit. I really love that about this wine. Um, so this wine's been open for about an hour and a half, hour and 15 minutes. So it's still opening up a little bit more, but it's still, but it's showing really well. So there's some nice, real dark fruit, like plums, maybe a little currant. Kind of get some cloves kicking in the back end of that. And then it's not a black licorice on this one for me. It's more of a red licorice, but not red vine. Not that real sweet red licorice. It's more of a brighter, fruitier kind of a licorice aroma for me uh, coming through. And we talked about in the video, that's kind of from that other side over closer to the highway that doesn't have as much rock in it. It seems to have a little more licorice in it. Mm. It smells wonderful. And then when you taste this, it's just lush. It's just this beautiful lush rush of dark spiced plum, some clove, cinnamon stick maybe um and then all oh, that fruit just kicks right back in the tail end of that finish i mean it's just it's a wine it should be called a reserve because of those the, the effect it has and it, how it you know and how it rolls across your tongue from the you know kind of if you kind of realize it hits you in the back of the mouth it kind of rolls forward hence remember we talked about wine glasses a few weeks ago the delivery system on wine glasses because that's the way the wine is tasted that's the delivery system for certain glasses. So you kind of get that effect on this one. You notice you're not getting super dried up by tannins. It's really kind of a, it's a more of a lushness. And this is the wine that's got a nice acid in it, but it's not like overpowering. It's just, it's just there holding that fruit up really well with the tannin structure. And the oak is there, and that's that cinnamon stick, that's that clove. This is all French oak uh, for this vintage. This didn't see, um, the reserves weren't, uh, have any, didn't have any American oak in it. Uh, this one just had uh, French oaks, French oak barrels. Probably, if I remember right, I think this wine was about 35. No, this one was higher. This was 45% French oak, brand new oak. And that's why that clove, I think, is so present. And there's some, um, just maybe a little bit of, and you get a little bit of a, uh, I kind of get this lingering chocolate. Like um, almost a sweeter, almost like a more of a milk chocolate or, or a very lighter style dark chocolate. There's like a mocha effect with this, which I really like. 
um, that kind of rolls through. And that's kind of that sweetness in the mid palate. But it's again, it's, it's that lingering lushness of this wine that I think is really good. And that's why I think pairing this with something a little bit sweeter style meats like pork and lamb uh, really do well with, with a wine like this. I mean, beef, you can make beef go with anything. That's an easy thing. It's these other cuts of meat, these other types of meats are a lot of fun to do. Don't be afraid by the way you spice or use herbs, you can uh, poultry will work really well too. So you can play with foods and do different things. Um, you know, I'm just thinking right now, garlic naan bread for some reason just hits me, but I could really go for that with this wine right now. Uh, this sounds really good. Uh, so yeah, some Napoli and some, uh, some yeah, some great tandoori bread, mm, that would be really good. So um, yeah. I could talk about this wine for a long time, but I'd rather drink it. The other thing too is if you have, if you look at this wine, look at that color, look at that depth of color and richness in it. And it's just by when you look at it and you know, here's the best way. It's when you pour it in your glass and you look at how dark and rich that pour is and, and how luscious it is. And it almost gives you a precursor of the mouthfeel and the flavors you're going to get. So, yeah, I could drink that. In fact, I am drinking it, right? So, I hope you guys are enjoying it as much as I am, <laughs> because I'm enjoying it like a little too much, probably. So, all right. So, that's the reserve. So, again, it's us tasting. Um, you know, we'll try to be, we'll shoot you guys some more videos of us when we're doing our tastings and our blends in the, in the upcoming year. But when we sit down um, and taste, if you go on our social media page, you'll see some of our past posts where we did post us doing that. We were doing the Dolcetto. It's the same we do for every varietal. We're tasting all the new barrels and rating them and picking out the ones we like the best to go to uh, the reserve program. So it really is a barrel selected wine uh, coming from our best vineyards uh, that we feel for that. Um, and so it's, uh, it is a labor of love going through and tasting all those and singling them out and making sure that we're presenting the best possible. Now this wine, if, if I remember correctly, I think we only made like 150 cases. It's not like we're making thousands of cases of this. It's a very small select batch. So when you see our reserve program, um, 500 cases is the max on any reserve that we do. And luckily that's what we're tasting here for the next couple of weeks actually is our reserves. Uh, with the cab next week, and then two reserves on the uh, last week of this, which is the 14th, which would be Coro, which is our Zen Reserve, and our Reserve Chardonnay. So, uh, so that's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to see a lot of our kind of barrel selection coming through on this. Um, this was the first year the reserve was 100% Merlot. Um, and it's gone back and forth between 100% Merlot and a little bit of cab over the years. But this was the first year it was actually 100% Merlot. And, uh, and I think it's well-deserved that that uh, rating as being a reserve wine for the Brutico family vineyards. All right, so let's talk about Torrent. So when we talk about Torrent, and you know, we say there's a, the rush of flavors and, uh, and the, the stream of aroma or whatever you want to put on the back label, right? So, the reason why is again, it's the creeks that go by there. And it is that, and even in the cab, even though the Cabernet is up on a hillside, it's still, everything drains to the creeks and it is a very rocky soil, which I'll show you next week when we start talking about Cabernet. So we made this blend, <laughs> excuse me, um, because I'll be honest, the Merlot was a tough sale retail as much as we love Merlot and people love Merlot. And a red blend is a little bit easier to sell and a red blend is a lot of fun to make. Um, and we have this killer, excellent uh, single vineyard uh, Merlot that we have from our Bliss Ranch now as a reserve. So we wanted to make something uh, that kind of showed a few different areas put together. And that's what blends do. And it's, it makes it an awesome wine. Um, it also makes it a lot bigger. Um, as big as our cab is, the torrent has been showing significantly larger than the cab. Part of that reason is because the Merlot is such a concentrated fruit wine and has a, such a depth and richness that that little bit of Syrah and Cab added to it make it a lot bigger than uh, the Cabernet, which is just almost 100% Cabernet most years. Um, so what this is then again is a Syrah. So 63% uh, so Merlot, 26% Cab, and 11% Syrah. 
Now, you showed you that Syrah vineyard and you saw how that dips down kind of and makes that bowl. So it changes the fruit profile and the flavors. It gets um, a little bit more fruity in the bowl, not quite as, not quite as um, Syrah-ish, produces a lot more fruit. Then when you come up on the steps uh, above that, where it gets a little bit heavier and more Syrah-like, a little more earthy. Uh, but we make our Syrah not to be too earthy. Um, the earthiness is there with the Syrah, and you can kind of pick it up a little bit here and there in the wines when you taste them, um, in this wine especially. But it's more about the fruit and the, and the boldness and the backbone that it brings to a wine. So, with Torrent, I was making the comment earlier, me and Kevin were just talking about how this wine has just blossomed in the last four months. It has been, it's gotten better and better. Um, you know, and it's and it's just because it's just it's just aging so well. So you still get that plum, you get that little bit of there's some black licorice in there. Um, the um, you get a little bit of a uh, espresso bean, maybe a little bit of maybe kind of a, a coffee, and you get some spice, and you get some really nice spice in the back end of that. Again, those are the barrels showing on this wine. Now in the very front, you get the boldness and the fruit of the cab. So think about that next week when we're tasting the 16 cab. That's that fruit profile from the cab coming in. And then right behind that, that's where that Syrah is. You get that Syrah in that mid palate. It's kind of lifting it up. And then you get that lushness, that big lushness, and that's the, the Merlot rolling through. And you kind of get that, uh, I don't know, maybe a... Again... I get that mocha. I'm getting that mocha fruit in the back end of it. And that's where that, that's where that blueberry, that chocolate covered blueberry right there just kicks in really hard. Cause you get that sweeter mocha fruit coming through. That's where the espresso starts kicking in. That's showing you those French oak barrels. In the beginning, you're getting a little more spice and a little bit, uh, a little bit more earthiness. That's the Syrah and that's our fusion barrels that I showed you before. We'll talk about those probably a little bit more next weekend with the, with the Zen. That's that Eastern European spice, I think, coming through right there. So on this wine, you're seeing effects of American oak, Eastern European oak, and French oak, as far as the new barrels go. You're seeing a little bit of everything. Um, I think that the Syrah being a Rhone and Eastern European oak really work well together as far as that blended barrel. And then the American oak works well with all three of these varieties, uh, with Merlot especially. Um, When you get this, and you get that kind of a tart fruit in the very beginning, that's the tannins kind of loading up in your mouth, and it kind of hits you in the roof of the mouth if you feel that effect, and it kind of rolls back. You know, and that's just, that's just the tannins just loading up a little bit more, but they still turn nice and sweet on the back end, and you get that nice big lushness coming through. Again, this is a little bit bigger wine. Um, you know, I can have this just as easy with prime rib uh, as I can with uh, Royal Crown Roast, a pork, um, steak on the barbecue, you know, it just, it works well. You know, when you're picking your meats, depends on the cut of the meat also. Um, the other thing about this wine that I love to do with this is this is a wine that's really great to marinate with or to make a sauce with. So we've had this before where we've done winemaker dinners where they, we've used this wine as the part of the reduction sauce. And that's the glaze that goes back over. And it's just amazing um, how that works so well uh, with that because of those, those three different varietals kind of kicking it in different ways and the different fruit profiles. I think the Syrah, so the more I swirl this and the more I open it up, the more the Syrah is kind of showing in the front end, you know, a little more earthiness there coming through. It's kind of over, a little overpowering, but again, that's because it's just opening up a little bit more and then the wine's kind of coming back together. But I'm still getting that rich mocha 
sweet fruit in the back end. And that's kind of the three of them kind of coming together a little bit more. And that's the barrels kind of showing through. Haas, do you want to maybe talk about the origins of the name Torrent? Uh, sure. That was a long discussion one day. <laughs> so Torrent being a, um, a body or a rushing uh, of water, right? A torrent is a, like a creek. The torrent of uh, water rushing through or something going through. And because the, the creeks were such an important part of the vineyard blocks where this wine was made from, that's why the name came. We had a couple of other names that, uh, that worked. Uh, Stampede was one. Um, we uh, kind of liked, uh, but uh, it was already taken. Uh, so, but the torrent just seemed to fit very well with the, uh, the area, the topography, and the creeks, and the rush of flavor that you got. So we first tasted this, that's why it's like, God, it's like this, it's like a stampede of flavor, right? You know, kind of going to that way. And we have the Contento Ranch, which has, which is an old cattle ranch. So that's where that kind of came from. So we tried to tie it back to, to its origins. So that's where torrent came from. Um, could you go over the difference, maybe a general explanation of, because I know it, it depends on, by varietal, it can change, but between the classic and the reserve series, like as a winemaker, a general explanation. Okay. So what we look at when, we, um, when, I'm, when I'm working for a classic wine versus, versus the reserve series, <laughs> I'm looking for that, that upper 10%. That upper echelon of wine that's just a little bit more elegant, maybe a little bit more boastful. The fruit pops just a little bit different. Or when I'm tasting individual barrels, a barrel might give you a different flavor that you really like that in a smaller lot will show, but blended away in a, in a, thousand, in a thousand cases, you'll lose it. But in 150 to 200 cases, it's there. So there's different nuances that you want to showcase, which showcases the wines better. Ageability is about, is always the same usually I would say. Um, the reserves tend to be a little bit bigger wines because of that, uh, because of that aspect of looking at those little nuances from barrels or from blocks. So they might age a little bit longer. Um, in fact, we usually use a little bit uh, uh, longer cork on the reserves so they do age a little bit longer, but it also means they need to lay down a little bit longer before they're ready to drink. Um, so that's probably the biggest difference, I would say, um, we'd like to, it's helping us showcase the niches that we find in our barrel program and in our vineyard blocks. Uh, Luke's on, by the way, and so is K-Bass. Oh, I got both of them. <laughs> um, so we have another question here. Uh, what is the difference, or is there a difference, between Syrah and Petit Syrah? Yes, there's a big difference. Um, Syrah is a Rhone varietal. Um, so it is actually a little bit more of an earthy, earthy style of, uh, um, of wine. So when people say you, know, you can almost taste the dirt in a Syrah, that's what they're talking about. You know, it does have that. Uh, the fruit profile is a little bit more um, maybe like medium, medium red fruit. So maybe think about, um, think about like a real dark cherry or, uh, or kind of a little bit of a, uh, maybe a, you know, like a red plum type of a thing, where Petit Syrah uh, is actually comes from a whole different region. Um, I can't remember exactly where Petit Syrah comes from, but it is a lot spicier grape. It has, um, uh, it's a darker, richer uh, grape that has um, uh, bigger, like darker plums and more berries. So it's just like, think about really overripe, like blackberries and, and things like that. That's where Petit Syrah is, and it has a spiciness and a pepperness, pepperiness that you get like in Zinfandel. That's why those two, usually you see those two together a lot. So um, that's the big difference. Syrah is usually, with Syrah is a little bit more elongated bunches, a little looser. Um, usually when Syrah gets really ripe, it starts dimpling, almost looks like a golf ball. That's usually when it's like perfect time to pick it. Petit Syrah is a very tight cluster bunch. It's very, uh, the grapes are all touching each other um, and they're actually very susceptible to mold and mildew and, and rot because of that, because they are such a tight bunch. Um, and they're very large and heavy. So um, that's the two, that's probably the, the biggest differences you've seen in the two. 
is, is that. And then of course the wine profiles are a lot different. Uh, the origin is Montpellier, France. Uh, another question here. How long would you lay down this reserve Merlot? I would say this wine's good for 20, 25 years at least. You'd lay it down. I would say it's drink. I mean, it's drinking really well right now. I would say probably lay it down for another five years and then start drinking it for sure. But I think it would last. There's a lot of fruit there, and there's some good structure. And I think that that will hold on. I think that's a, one of those wines that in 20 years when you open it up, you're going to be amazed that there's still going to be a little fruit left in that wine. Um, so, yeah. I don't know. It tastes pretty good now. I'd, I'd lay it down in a glass and start drinking. <laughs> Or just get a bottle for now. And yeah, bottle, bottle for later. Now, bottle for later. Yeah. Bottle of red. I guess there aren't too many questions. The the next question is: Are you wearing pants right now? Okay, that's no. I'm not. <laughs> I'll send you a photo a, later. A, a bottle a year. I like that. So yeah, we talked about that year. last week. Yeah. Uh, you know. Get six and try them every six months. Yeah, and just start laying them down and just start tasting them, you know, so you don't miss out. Try them with different things. <laughs> and one of the things, um, oh, that was a little high pitch. One of the things we want, to, we want you guys to do for us also is that next week with the cab, send us your favorite beef recipes. Send us how you cook your steak, your roast, your prime rib, grandma's stew, you know. Because beef comes, you know, there's so many different things you can do with beef, and Cabernet is really known for steak and roast. And people think about that a lot more. And like I said, it's one of the reasons why we don't talk a lot about cooking with beef in a lot of these uh, these sessions is because it is pretty common, and people are pretty used to that. And we're trying to look at things that are kind of outside the box a little bit more, and a little more just to have a little bit of fun with. Uh, just like we like to experiment in the winery with yeast barrels and different blends, it's the same thing with us in the kitchen. We always like to experiment with different, uh, different ingredients. So over the weeks, we've kind of talked about the different bottle shapes and the origins for those, but this is the first reserve we've seen. So is there a reason that it's taller? Just to differentiate, it's, a, it's, it's more about, uh, it's just differential to where it stands taller, it looks more regal, um, and that's the reason why. You, know, you get that height, um, we use a different packaging on it. These are silk screen bottles as compared to a label that's put on. So it's all about, it's part of the packaging. Um, the other reason too is that, of course, it lays down uh, for a longer period of time. So that also, um, that's also part of the process, but um, it's, just, uh, it's just more of an elegant, taller bottle that stands out. What was the first vintage for Torrent? 2014? Yeah. yeah. 2014. And where do you see uh, uh, Torrent going from here? I think you mentioned maybe some new blenders or... Yeah, Torrent's going to keep expanding. This is not its final resting place by any means. Um, we've planted Malbec, we've planted Petit Verdot to use as a blender um, to keep going forward. We talked about before, you have to remember in, uh, in Bordeaux on uh, one side of the bank uh, is Merlot base, on the other side of the bank it's Cab base. So this is kind of where we're looking at with this wine is to become, uh, you know, take that Merlot, um, use a little bit more Petit Verdot and Malbec going down the road, change the fruit profile and the structure, make it even a bigger wine than it is now, um, and add some different flavor profiles to where, um, you know, it's kind of be a flagship wine of some kind. And actually those vineyards are very gravelly soils also, which is kind of amazing. And they're like the, one of the, some of the furthest blocks away from the Greek. So, yeah. On the, on the Petit Syrah, since you were talking about how they were bigger bunches and, and pretty tight clusters, do we machine harvest or hand pick those? Those are actually all um, hand picked. We have those, those are uh, what's called a head prune, or the head trained vines as part of our old world block. Um, and when we do Coro, we're actually gonna go into that block, take some video and show you the vines. The thing we also have to do more with those is we have to make sure they're opened up and we trim, uh, we actually kind of, knock the load down so we drop almost as much tonnage on the ground as we harvest when it comes to the petite Syrah to make sure that they don't rot to make sure they open up and they ripen really well um, they they come they throw wings and double clusters uh, that we clip off and the same the same thing so i'll show you some of that 
Um, I think the vines will be, uh, the clusters will be big enough. I can kind of show you what a wing looks like uh, when we clip them off and, and what we're looking at there. Can you touch on uh, some vegetarian pairings for the, these two wines? Um, no. Uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Um, yeah, I will tell you something that's really good with this. Uh, um, vegetarian uh, lasagna really works well with something like this. You know, the zucchini noodle uh, using the, uh, and using the marinara sauce, uh, vegetarian marinara sauce works good. Um, uh, eggplant, I think, works really well, especially grilled. Grilled vegetables, I think, work well, especially if you marinate them with a little olive oil. And then with garlic, salt, and pepper, just lightly seasoned, uh, do quite well. Um, I haven't experimented a lot with the garden burger, as you can see. I don't eat a lot of garden burgers. Um, but uh, I think that those would work well for the few that I've had, some, some of the higher end ones, uh, as far as that goes. Salads, I think you could do a lot with some different salads, especially, um, you know, kind of think lentils, like a lentil salad. Um, even a quinoa uh, salad would do well with kale. Um, if you, you know, you start mixing up the, put that in with some fresh parsley, uh, quinoa, some good high grade olive oil, some red chili flakes. I think that would be the key and, and some different spices would work really well uh, doing that. Um, you know, and you know, just like I said earlier, I'm sitting here thinking, you know, good hummus and, uh, and some naan bread, I was gonna be happy with this tonight. So there's a lot of things like that. So yeah, it's an experimentation to find those flavor profiles, but um, a lot of nuts and seeds carry those same flavors. And in fact, I think some of those maybe uh, some of those uh, some of those nut profiles will probably work really well uh, with these wines. Uh, what what wines go well with venison? Someone here likes to run them over with their car. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say probably I would go more tart for venison. I think Syrah and venison would kind of made for each other per personally. Um, I don't hit them with my car. But I do find other methods, and we're not going to talk about that now. <laughs> Portobello mushroom steaks, a good veggie dish. Oh, yeah, no, that's an awesome one. Yeah, especially you marinate them with a little balsamic vinegar. Oh, yeah, totally. It took, and actually, you know, pesto, think about with pesto, the same thing. That pine nut garlic with that pesto, the basil um, on top of that. Um, how do you decide? the percentages for a torrent and do they change year to year? It's more, more yeah, they do change year to year. It just depends on what the wine's tasting like. Um, I was doing that, to, I was actually tasting, blending torrent today, uh, worked on that for a while, didn't like where it was going, just kind of stopped, I'm gonna come back to it again, probably. Uh, we just we just put some of the sub blends together. I think they were just a little bit shocked, so I wanna wait um, and uh, do it again later on. But yeah, it's it, every year's different. Uh, let's see, 2015, I believe, was actually 76% Merlot. It actually could have been called Merlot if we wanted it to. So everything changes. Uh, right now, I'm playing with um, the torrent I'm working on right now is 2018. We're like at 70% Merlot and 20% Ciroc. So uh, it just it, it depends on the vintage and what the vineyards and Mother Nature gives me. Uh, going back and forth. There's no such thing as a recipe uh, to make it work. Um, like I said, this one was 63% Merlot. Um, the year before that was 75. So it, it bounces back and forth. What do you mean by uh, some of the wines were a little shocked? So when we start, when you pump wine and you move wine or bottle wine, anytime you do something, it kind of shocks it. And it kind of puts it back. So it's like, that's why you don't really want to put wine on a market to after it's been um, in, under cork especially for at least a year, because it has what's called bottle shock. So what happens is it kind of just, you know, the fruit kind of rolls back and doesn't show very well. So you get a lot more of the acid and tannin showing instead of the fruit. So by letting the wine rest and relax, basically, uh, you know, it's the same thing. And you kind of get it when it relaxes, then the fruit shows. And then you can see exactly what you're working with. Can you talk about irrigation in the vineyard and... Um maybe how it differs through the vineyard and uh, through the growing season? So one of the best irrigation methods to make um, higher end wine is called deficit irrigation. And because our soils are so rocky where these wines come from, we actually do that more in a natural way. 
So we look to make sure that the vines have plenty of water. So by looking at um, how much moisture content is actually in the vine is how we judge on how we water. Depending upon the week, uh, depending upon the weather pattern, is how many gallons uh, we put on each vine. With the drip irrigation is what we use, you're really actually putting the water right to the vine. So we know that our emitters put out so many gallons per hour, then we know how many hours we need to put on the water for, uh, for that vineyard. Um, and when we have a big heat spike coming in, we'll actually elevate the water early before the heat spike so the vines can suck up a bunch of water. So before those 100 degree days hit, the vines have some, you know, they're just full of water. So it's kind of like us, you know, we're going to hydrate and we're going to hydrate well before we go outside in the hot weather or when we're going to go for a run or work out or something. And afterwards, we need a lot of water again because we've lost so much water. Uh, it's the same for the vines. So we have to watch that type of so. Right now, we're not really, we're not watering uh, because there's plenty of water and moisture in the ground. Uh, we'll probably start watering, I'll bet, you, I would say within the next two to three weeks, we're gonna have to start putting some water back on. Uh, the wind, it's really windy right now, so that's helping to dry out the ground. Um, and then, you know, uh, and then the other problem we have is water conservation. We're only allowed to use X amount of water, so that's the other thing we gotta be careful of is how much water we have. So we hope for a, mild summer with good 80 degree plus growing days but not 140 you know what i mean <laughs> so uh you know so that's kind of where we're at uh what kind of soil does the merlot grow in and it, is it the same type of soil throughout the multiple vineyards so i guess it's more of a soil question and how much do they change in in all the vineyards oh every block's different and within every block it's different and i showed you the pictures if you if you saw the videos from earlier on and we'll show them again after we're done here you see the Merlot, where this block of Merlot comes from, it's just, it's large rocks. It's a bunch of rocks that are like this big, and it's all gravel. So there's not a lot of actual dirt there, but there's just enough to retain some moisture. Um, and that was on, then you go over about 25 rows from that where the edge is next to that creek, there's actually less rock and more dirt. So within that same block, you have two different soils pretty much because there's less rock. It's the same loam but it's a different because there's so much more rock you have a whole different nutrient level coming through now if you saw the syrah that i showed you again it's a different soil type but it's completely on the other side of the valley so even within the same block you always get different uh, soil types around here and it's just that's our topography that's why we have our avas that we do that's why mendocino is so much different than napa and sonoma or any other place and hoplin so much different than ukiah because the soil profiles we have are because of the hills, the mountains, the watershed, the creeks, the river, the flooding. So it's always a lot different. And if you go onto YouTube and check out our pre-show from the, uh, uh, was it last week or the week before, we showed the soil shift. Yeah, that was and, the week before. And there's yeah. a really good image visual of that soil shifting in mid block. You can actually see it change. Uh, and, and can you, just to expand on the soil a little more, can you explain terms like loam and sandy loam or gravelly sandy loam? Well, gravel is gravel. We know what gravel is. It's rock, right? So sand, think about the sand that you're on the beach. And think about, we say loam, loam is a style. Loam is a very rich dirt that you'll see. It's just like, just to say dirt, okay? And what you do is if you want sandy loam, throw, throw a couple of handfuls of sand in that. That's sandy loam. Throw some rock in there. You got rocky loam. Um, there's so many different, there's loam, we say loam, but it's actually very, there are a lot of different actual soil types. There's actually soil maps, and each soil has its own name. This is, I'm not sure, your dad could probably pop in on this. Talmadge loam is what we have here, mainly is what it's called. Um, and depending upon what it is, uh, the levels of the size of the granules and the other particulates in it depend upon what the, um, what it's called. So. That's kind of where that comes. That's where those terms come from, and that's what they mean. That's vague as I could get. <laughs> uh, we'll we'll do an easy one. What would you serve a tri tip? Beer. Um, <laughs> that's for you, Luke. Uh, I would do. I'd do either one of these wines. Actually, I like Zen with tri tip a lot. I'll be honest with you, but um, you know, that's it all depends on how I spice it. Really, I'll be honest with you, but. For a, meat, for a cut like tri-tip, I'd drink Zinfandel. These wines, I'm thinking more of a roast. I think these will do a lot more, a lot better with the roast. A little bit sweeter maybe, you know, style, you know, not much, not as minerally, 
You gotta think about the sirloin area, a little more minerally, the meat uh, flavors. These are more sweeter. So more of the tenderloin, like you know, beef tenderloin, this is definitely, I'd be looking at something like this. You have a compliment on your shirt color choice again tonight. Oh, thank you. A couple of compliments, very nice. Thanks, honey. <laughs> Your honey may not like who you just called honey. Yeah. Um, are your vineyards uh, ever fertilized? Uh, yes. Um, we have in the past done uh, commercial fertilizers, which are a liquid that goes through our drip system. Um, and we use also uh, compost as a fertilizer. So right now we are mainly using compost. Uh, we're putting compost out and re-energizing the soil that way. Um, it's a little bit slower method um, to do that, um, but it's a better, healthier soil to make better, healthier grapes. So. Sorry, guys, I'm sitting here. I'm looking at the question <laughs> scrolling up. <laughs> All right. Hey, I wore the right color shirt because I can spell. <laughs> Almost wore a light colored shirt, but I knew better when it comes to red wine. Hey, so next week, just to let you guys know again, we are gonna be doing some cab. Um, we're gonna be looking at the reserve cab and uh, the Brutico Cabernet. We'll go for the first time out to, well, we've been out to the Contento Ranch a little bit with the Primitivo, but this, we'll kind of go and look a little bit more in depth at the Cabernet out the Contento Ranch um, and, uh, and do that. We might get Len to get back out there and maybe he can take some, uh, give us a little soil lesson. Um, next week, so you guys, since uh, we talk so much about soils, and we can and look at that a little bit more, also. Um, oh, uh, by the way, we we used about 900 tons of compost this year. 900 tons, yeah, I know we used a lot. A lot. So. Um, how deep do vine roots go? Uh, it depends if they're dry farmed or how they're irrigated. Now, tap roots will usually uh, the tap root of the vine will go down about six feet. But the main feeder roots will, depending on like drip irrigation, uh, when drip water hits, it kind of hits at the top and it makes like this little kind of makes a cone. So that's where the concentration of roots will go. So the tap roots won't be as deep. Um, on dry farmed uh, vineyards, you can see roots go, at, if I remember right, is 10 to 12 feet easily because they're going down to grab that water and to sustain for longer periods of time. Um, but most roots for most conventional vineyards with the drip irrigation system, I would say probably three feet, uh, more than likely. It also depends on the type of soil because all of a sudden if there's a clay pan and they hit that, they don't go any deeper than that. They don't penetrate the clay. And you can usually see that because the vines are weaker, or if they're dying, there's, a, there's an issue. Um, can you talk about our cover crops and, what, and the reason for them and what they are? So cover crops that we put in vary year to year. Um, they're there to be uh, act as a nutrient for later on. So usually it's some type of a legume is in there um, or a clover. Uh, so they're generating nitrogen on those polyps on the roots and they become a compostable material that you can plow back in, uh, which will help retain nitrogen in the soil for you and water uh, later on. So it acts as a natural fertilizer. A lot of people use it. There's many different mixes. It depends upon your climate, what you're trying to add back to the soil, uh, what you're trying to take out of the soil. So uh, there are mixes that they, there are certain, um, certain things that when you, when you put them back in the soil, certain legumes and clovers, um, even fava beans and sunflowers, when you put those back in, they'll help uh, reduce the uh, toxic toxicity of like boron, magnesium, and other things like that that are toxic to the vines. Go this way. Um, do we use any chickens in the vineyards to control bugs or any other animals? No, we don't. Um, we have uh, wild hogs that root up the bottom of the vines for us quite well uh, in a couple of our vineyards. Uh, but those are feral animals that come through. But no, we don't, uh, uh, we're not a biodynamic uh, vineyard. We are a sustainable vineyard. So a lot of biodynamic vineyards use, uh, use animals in there to, to take out to a lot of weed control and insects. Um, but um, as, as large as we are, it'd be kind of hard to do. Uh, we have, uh, we talk about it 
and uh, someday we might, but not at this time. Uh, we do have the owl boxes, which is good yeah. for rodents. We have rodents. predator boxes, yeah. We have for owls, for bats, uh, different things like that. Uh, we try to make habitats for birds of prey to help take out gophers, uh, which is a big help. Are we going to continue the virtual tastings beyond the May 14th date? Sure. <laughs> I don't know when, but yeah. No, we, that's, right now our goal is why we are in the state of, uh, you know, the shelter in place. We'll probably try to continue these on a weekly basis somehow. Um, then we'll probably look at rolling them into maybe a bi-weekly, I'm not sure, or maybe just once a month. Um, but uh, those, are quite, those are good questions. But um, as long as, uh, People keep showing up and you bring your friends and we have a big enough audience, we'll keep doing this. And aside from the virtual tastings, we are uh, trying to do more video content in general and putting that on our YouTube channel. Yeah. All right. Um, and right now there's uh, no plan on more six packs, but the sale is still going on. So you can, if we add more dates, we'll let you know what wines there are and you can definitely pick those up um uh, with the sale prices uh at least through mid-may i mean we'll probably look at doing some more than more of the italians which we haven't done yet uh some of the other offerings that you know we have a lot of other wines that you like the uber tuscan uh we do have a sangiovese um we you know we, we have the we did the quadriga and we have the primitivo we'll probably look at maybe doing a, a, a side by side primitivo zinfandel we do have the bliss line that we'd like to talk about a little bit show you guys you know taste the bliss wines and look at those a little bit more also. So there's some different, there are different aspects uh, that we'll start doing. Um, we'll, you know, we can do a whole lot about Oak, uh, especially when we start talking about Bliss, it's a whole other program. So there's a lot more content there for us. So we'll come up with something more than likely. Until I start getting hate mail from Kansas, probably. <laughs> Hey, Cave asks, how's John the Baptist too? You okay? All right, everybody. Looks like we're running out of questions. Um, again, I'd like to thank everybody for joining us uh, and, um, and making this happen. Again, my hat's off to uh, Kevin Brutico, who is the, uh, the master of all this, our producer, director, um, and the extraordinary question asker. Um, so next week, we're doing CAB. Um, everybody stay safe out there, and uh, we will see you uh, next Thursday at 5.30 once again here. And uh, so anyway, have fun, everybody, and uh, stay safe. Enjoy your wine, and remember, the only difference between a connoisseur and a wino is a brown paper bag. Cheers.